to increase your incident response game, how you can make this as painful as possible for the adversary. And that's kind of the theme of this talk, is no pain, no gain. What we want to do is try to um, use the tools and capabilities and follow a framework, and, and you'll see the framework as we go through the slides, that uh, you can use to compare against your current processes, your current tools. If you're evaluating tools for incident response, you know, this is sort of a good framework and a good idea to keep in mind as you're moving through that. Um, as to, to, you know, ways to improve your current processes and tools, uh, and, and again, uh, with the idea of making it as hard as possible for the adversary. You know, if we look at sort of the landscape and the, the, the balance of power as it is between the adversary and the incident responder, the balance of power definitely favors the, the attacker. The attacker gets to pick the place and time, the method, they could be very patient, they could be very uh, persistent. In fact, if you're dealing with a professional adversary, they are both. They're very patient, very persistent. You know, just as you punch in and you come into security operations center or you work for you know, network security or whatever your role is within you know, the different organizations that you represent, you know, they punch in and their role, their job is to break into your network and steal your data. Now, whether that's for intellectual property or whether that's for financial gain, um, regardless, uh, that's their job, that's what they do, they're professionals, and they know how to do this because they do it all the time. They, this is their nine to five job. Um, you know, they, they will take their time, gather a lot of information about their target so that they can understand exactly what weaknesses are present in an organization and then use those weaknesses to get into the environment. And once they're inside the environment, they have a plan for what they want to do and how they're going to do it, and they go about executing it as quickly as possible. Um, so, you know, the fact of the matter is, the sad fact of the matter is, as a blue team member, which I've traditionally been a member of the blue team, so believe me, I feel your pain, um, you know, we have to succeed all the time. The attacker really only has to succeed, succeed once. And so, you know, again, the balance of power definitely does not favor uh, the blue team in that regard. So this is the life of the typical SOC analyst, you know, please stop hurting my network, please stop attacking my, my systems, uh, because that just, that's basically, uh, the, again, the, the current balance of power. Uh, and so the idea here is, you know, let's shift the balance of, of power on this. And how, what are some strategies, some ways that we can use uh, to in increase the pain on the adversary. Um, what are some ways that we can make this as difficult as possible for the adversary? Um, it, recognizing that at least in this phase of IT securities development, to some degree, intrusion is going to be inevitable. All right, I know that there's some contention around that as a concept. I actually do agree with the concept that, you know, in theory, we should be able to defend networks and systems to a point where it becomes practically impossible. And I do think that there are systems that, you know, do reflect that. I think, however, on, on the whole, enterprise systems and networks are so complex that it is a very, very difficult task. And from, uh, you know, a security vendor standpoint, of which, you know, I represent one, uh, the fact of the matter is, Nobody's come out with a silver bullet yet. And so on some level, I think that, you know, mature organizations have adopted the, the, uh, the, the rationale, have adopted the, the posture that intrusions are inevitable. They are going to happen. Um, and so what do we want to do? You know, what steps, what concrete steps can we take to ensure that the adversary's job is as difficult as possible? You know, one of the big things is reducing that awareness window. Um, awareness window reduction is key. If you look at reports from Mandiant, from uh, Verizon, from other uh, organizations that track trends in, in this area, um, you'll see that that's actually being reduced, but it's still really high. We're still seeing, you know, average uh, awareness or response times in the hundreds of days, which, you know, look at a calendar. I mean, that's a very, very long time for an adversary to be unopposed inside your network. So basically, if, if they have that kind of time to get into your network, to be able to move around, perform lateral movement, and that type of reconnaissance, and they can basically execute on whatever their, their plan is for your network uh, very easily within that period of time. Uh, so it's key to try to reduce that <coughs> awareness window to as tight of a window as possible. 
Now, one of the approaches that uh, organizations are, are adopting more and more is the concept of continuous hunting, you know, and to have people who are dedicated to that. Um, yeah, if you've been around the security field for any length of time, uh, I've certainly worked with a number of organizations and, and represented different vendors in this space where, you know, the approach has traditionally been this idea of you respond to an alert. So red light starts blinking, that means something happened, let's go respond to it. And certainly you can't ignore those red lights when the red lights are blinking, but organizations that have increased their maturity level understand that for those, uh, again, for that professional adversary that's trying to get into your network to execute on an agenda, that individual is going to do everything possible not to trip those red lights. Uh, they are, they, they, it is their goal in life not to trigger those red lights. And so you can't just wait for that red light to blink. Um, it's, it's oftentimes too late. You know, it's the canary in the coal mine. By the, by the time the canary drops dead, it's probably too late to get out of that coal mine. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the damage has already happened. And the same is true. So with continuous hunting, you know, it kind of takes the posture that you assume that a breach has occurred and you search for the evidence that would either support or uh, deny that proposition. And uh, quite honestly, the, the bulk of that activity, the bulk of what your, your hunters are going to see in that situation is normal traffic. They're going to see normal activity. But that's good because it gives you a baseline. You understand what is happening in the environment on a normal basis, you know. Um, case in point, uh, to, is it normal for my systems in finance to be talking to websites in Ukraine, right? Is that something that I should worry about? If that's something that's normal, that's happening all the time because we've got financial interests in that part of the world and that's where, uh, you know, the, some of this applications or, or this banking is taking place, then that's fine. It's not something we need to spend some time working on. Uh, but the only way you understand that is if you have a baseline of what the, the system should look like, uh, you know, going forward. You should, you should have some, hopefully have some idea of what's normal and what isn't. And the more understanding that you have on that, the easier it will be to spot those anomalies when they crop up. Um, and that's, that's really, uh, there's no one way to do that. There's no uh, uh, single method in doing that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's crucial to be, to being effective at that continuous hunting role. And that's, that's a, again, a big part of what that continuous hunting does. Um, security basics. It's not sexy. It's not, uh, you know, there's, there's all the acronyms that I'm not going to throw out there. You guys hear it all the time. Um, that's not to say that, uh, you know, there aren't APTs, there aren't zero days. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you talk to any pen testers or red team folks, they will tell you that, you know, they don't have to get, reach that dig in that deep into their bag of tricks. I mean, it, 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 there's so many vulnerabilities, so many ways in, um, that they don't have to really get that sophisticated most times to get into a network. And so it really kind of comes down to security basics and hygiene. You know, you could think of it like the watertight doors on a submarine, right? The, you can't buy one thing that you can put into your environment or on your network. There's this one big red magic button, and when you push it, everything's secure. You know, and the same is true with those watertight doors on a submarine. They don't have a single watertight door that when they start taking on water, if the hull's breach, that they can close that door and, okay, we're not going to sink. They've got a lot of them, and they're in all kinds of strategic places, and then they're there for different reasons. And the same is true when we're addressing, you know, things like security hygiene and basics in your environment, patching, segmentation, you know, bastion hosts, you know, two-factor authentication. A lot of this comes back to, again, awareness of what's in the environment. Um, and, you know, having the proper tool set and the proper expertise to be able to understand what's on your network. It sounds so basic. It sounds so obvious. Like, well, I know what's on my network. Uh, do you really? Uh, you know, most enterprises are actually kind of surprised uh, when they start looking into these areas and they realize, holy smokes, we had no idea that we were running this five-year-old version of some code that's got so many vulnerabilities in it that, you know, they won't even fit on the page. Uh, and that's been running out there. Uh, or maybe they had a QA environment that they never expected to be, you know, connected to their production, <laughs> and yet it was. And so, you know, that's one of those areas where 
uh, that, that awareness, that baselining, and those security basics really come into play. And then finally, uh, again, this is where you have to work your way up the maturity stack. Not every organization is at this level of maturity, but it is definitely something that every organization should aspire to, and that is uh, to build your own intel gathering capability. Um, you know, the, the most relevant threat intel comes from inside your network. Uh, there's some really awesome threat intel companies that have uh, come out in the last, say, five to six years in particular, and they have some really good information. But to be perfectly honest, in a lot of cases, what they're selling really is data points. Um, it, it, there are some organizations that have curated intelligence, and, and the, you know, if, if anybody would like to discuss it afterwards, that, you know, we can talk about that. It's kind of outside of the theme of this particular presentation. But by and large, a lot of those, what passes as an intel feed, is really just data points. It's, it's information, and we're going to kind of talk about what those data points are in just a moment. Um, but I thought a really interesting statistic was that last bullet item, the uh, Verizon um, uh, data breach uh, incident response report, the most recent one. They showed only a 3% overlap between threat intel providers that they reviewed. And think about that for a minute, 3%. Now imagine if there was only a 3% difference between McAfee and Symantec, or between Symantec and Kaspersky. I mean, that's huge. Usually the differences between those companies are, you know, they could be measured as 3% as a difference, but to only have a 3% overlap, I mean, that, that shows that there's a wide margin of information that's out there. And the other thing, too, to, to think about with, the, with threat intel providers, it's great that they have information about, let's say, a financial fraud operator in Belarus that uses these particular tools against these, you know, in these campaigns. And I'm not saying that that isn't good information, but the question is, is it relevant? Is it relevant to your environment? And, you know, it may be relevant depending upon your, your industry segment, or it may not be. It may just be even more noise that you have to deal with, which, you know, in your position, particularly as a SOC analyst or people who run SOCs, you already have a lot of noise to begin with. So it, it just becomes more information that you have, have to process that, that doesn't really add a lot of value to what you're doing. But if you look at the attacks and the things that are happening in your environment, there is no more relevant threat intel than what's happening in your environment. I mean, it, that's completely relevant because it's happening to you. Uh, now, it may have correlations with other campaigns that are happening elsewhere. There, there may be some correlations, and that's where some of these threat intel, threat sharing uh, websites and, and things of that nature can really come in handy. But if you're not gathering that information, you know, all too often, organizations, their incident response plan is to just wipe the box and move on. And there is a whole galaxy of information and artifacts and intel that you can gather off of those systems. And we're going to talk about that in detail as we go through this. Uh, that, that hopefully, as again, as you move up that maturity scale, um, that's what enterprises should be, you know, aspiring to. That's what you should be moving into. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, it, it isn't easy, quite honestly, but the payoff is, when you start to see some of these things happening again and again and again, you start to recognize that potentially it's the same people involved, uh, and it gives you a different perspective on how you might respond to that, instead of just simply, again, wiping the box and moving on. Uh, because chances are really good that if an adversary has gotten into your environment and the box that you're aware of, there's probably five or ten others that you're not aware of, and, you know, you... Just by wiping that box out, you haven't stopped them at all. So, and that kind of leads us into what I was mentioning before. You know, data is not the same as Intel. Um, Intel requires data. In order to create intelligence, you have to have data. Uh, but what's important to, to create Intel is the analysis of that data. And it, you guys can't see that. I apologize. The font size is really small on this. But these slides will be available for download from the ISSA, so you can get a copy of them. Uh, but that's a quote from the CIA. That's a, this is a document from the CIA, and it's, it's uh, uh, basically defining what is intelligence. And you can see I bolded it there. 
Um, the information and knowledge about an adversary gained through observation, investigation, analysis, or understanding. So, again, um, getting a collection of IP addresses, getting a collection of, of hashes or checksums of known bad, there's value in that. But that is not, in and of itself, threat intel. Threat intel really is the analysis of that and understanding how that contextually, you know, applies or doesn't apply to your environment. Uh, and, and the only way that you really kind of gather that is by, you know, analyzing that. And again, the best source for this intel really is inside of your environment. So when we talk about, you know, increasing the pain to the adversary, when we talk about incident response, we really should start with some goals of what it is that we need to do. And uh, what we really need to do very quickly is, A, reduce that exposure window. So that goes back to what we talked about, where we want to uh, identify that this is happening as quickly as possible, and again, reduce that exposure window, give that attacker a minimal amount of inform or not information, minimal amount of time in your environment uh, to be able to accomplish their agenda. Uh, determine the scope. So <clears throat> that goes back to what I mentioned before. We need to quickly be able to identify all of the affected systems. It's important when you have an indicator on one system to be able to identify that that system is, is potentially compromised. Maybe patient zero may not be. But you have to be able then to be able to fan that out at scale across your enterprise. Um, and quite honestly, a lot of organizations just don't have the tool sets or the expertise to be able to do that. Uh, and there are a lot of really good open source tools that are out there that allow you to do that. There's some really good commercial tools that are out there that allow you to do that. Um, if anybody, again, would like to have a deeper discussion on what some of those tool sets are, I'd be happy to, uh, to have that discussion after, after the presentation. Uh, but determining scope is really, really important. And it leads into the next bullet item of limiting damage. You, once we know what the scope of this intrusion is, once we know what the scope of the impact into our environment is, <clears throat> we have to be able to limit the damage. Uh, and again, this may be quarantining those systems. That may be in some way putting a firewall rule in at your perimeter to prevent that uh, adversary from coming in. Um, it, it really is going to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but you, of course, need to do this in... Uh, in in, in uh, sequence, you have to make sure that you understand what that scope is before you attempt to start to limit the damage. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, investigate and gather evidence. So uh, notice that that is after limiting damage. So uh, there are capabilities and there are ways to be able to limit what's happening in terms of your exposure through quarantine, through firewall rules, through different... Um, response steps that still maintain those forensic artifacts and allow you then to take a deeper look at what's happening on those endpoints in order to gather that intelligence, in order to gather those data points that you can then use for your inter internal intelligence uh, uh, efforts. And then, of course, to be able to remediate. Um, you know, remediation would be then the rejection of that threat actor, returning the systems to normal, and completely expelling them out of the environment. But it's also continuously monitoring to see if they come back. Because if this is a professional adversary, again, it's their job to get into your environment. Um, and so it's not enough simply to expel them out of it, because they will be back. And so, again, it goes back to that circular sort of um, uh, process where we have that continuous hunting, we see something of interest that needs to be investigated, we perform, you know, we, we identify what the scope is, uh, we limit the damage, uh, we investigate, gather that information, and then remediate. And it's this constant circle uh, that, that you're, you're going to go through that. And then all of this leads up to gathering lessons learned to be able to spot future attacks. So, for instance, if you know that uh, the adversary uses, as a matter of course, that they are creating um, encrypted uh, RAR files, you know, and, and something along those lines. You you can put into place different 
tools or different automated functions to be able to look for those in your environment. And when you spot them, particularly if they have unusual names or if they're in unusual location, excuse me, unusual locations on the endpoint, um, that could lead you to then understand that these endpoints or these other endpoints need to be investigated. But again, that goes back to that cyclical cycle where we need to understand what that baseline is. We need to have some understanding of what happened from these attacks so that we retain that information going forward and we can use that to spot future attacks. So then it becomes a question of what data do we collect? And ideally, you know, if we come back to our, our SOC analysts here, um, if we have the proper tools, if we have the proper processes in place, and we're collecting the proper information, you know, it goes from a situation where uh, the, the poor person is pleading, please not to hurt my network, to, you know, come at me, bro, right? Um, so, how do we make this as painful as possible for the adversary? So we're going to talk about, this is the construct that I mentioned earlier on in my talk, where this is referred to as the pyramid of pain. And this is a great tool for understanding what the different levels are in terms of incident response, what the level of pain is for the adversary. And the idea is to move up the stack to get to the most painful places for that adversary or those adversaries to change. Um, and, and to understand, you know, where in your current response tool set, where in your current response processes you are in terms of this maturity, and then hopefully, you know, again, get up to the top of this pyramid where you're operating at the, the highest level possible. Uh, this was actually created by an individual at Mandiant by the name of David Bianco. Um, and what it does is it models from trivial to tough. It starts at the bottom with trivial to change uh, aspects of different attacks and malware or, um, um, you know, indicators, if you will. Uh, and then it ascends in difficulty. It begins with data at the bottom and it ends with intel. Because in order to get to that top tier, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, you know, it takes more than just the individual components and the individual data on those different layers. So if we look at the bottom layer, hash values, um, this is the bulk of what a lot of threat feeds provide, and this is good information. It's certainly uh, very useful information. Uh, I would say that from an operational standpoint, this is also something that most companies or most organizations kind of struggle to operationalize. It's one thing to get a list of hashes, then how do you go out and then look at all of the disk drives in the environment or look at all the running processes in the environment and identify whether or not that's active in your environment. Um, some organizations are able to do that. Um, there are some tools that you can see I've listed here. You know, uh, that I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, you can see that there's various tools that if you're investigating a particular system and you have a particular sample, there's certainly easy command line tools that you can use pretty much on every platform in order to generate a hash. And then there are a, a number of different, you can see along the bottom, virus total, of course, being probably the most uh, well known. Uh, there's a number of different sources that you can use to then uh, determine whether or not that hash is a true positive, whether that's, uh, you know, benign. Um, and there are some real benefits to hash values in terms of being able to identify whether or not this is a threat in our environment. Um, it is a very valuable uh, tool, uh, but th there are also very significant limitations that need to be understood. So, you know, it's very high confidence. The, the chance of having a hash uh, false positive are really, really low. I won't say it's impossible, but it's really, really low. So if, if you get a trigger on an MD5 or a SHA-1 hash, chances are really good that's a true positive. But where it gets problematic is it's trivial to change. I mean, it's absolutely trivial to change. So, uh, you know, anybody, 10-year-old kids uh, have access who can Google can create a customized uh, EXEs and, and be able to uh, change that hash at will. Um, and so there's a really fast burn rate on that. And you add into that, you know, the idea of using different packers or obfuscation tools for malware or creating custom shellcode, which again is not exactly difficult to do. 
anybody who can Google and who has access to, to Metasploit, MSF Venom, can create shell code all day long. So, you know, it's something that had never been seen before. And so, of course, that hash is going to be seen as benign, even in cases where it isn't. Uh, so, it can be a very valuable tool if you see particular um, um, running processes that are uh, that are suspicious in your environment. It certainly is a data point to gather, and it's definitely part of what should be your your threat intelligence uh, gathering. Uh, but but it does have significant limitations. And and again, it should be remembered that in many cases organizations kind of struggle with how to operationalize that. So that's something that when you're looking at your different tool sets. When you're looking at your different processes, you know, you start to, to ask yourself, you know, how would I, how would I take that list of hashes from um, FSISAC or from uh, InfraGuard or from, you know, any number of different places and actually operationalize that in my environment? And could I? And if you can't, if the answer to that question is no, then you really should be looking at ways and tools that, that you can implement that at a wide scale. We move up another layer in the stack, IP addresses. Again, you know, this is, this can be a really good thing to be able to trigger on. Um, you can uh, find these in your firewall logs, your web server logs, IPS logs. There's a whole list of places where you can identify these artifacts. Um, the, the problem with IP addresses from, again, a, a forensic standpoint or an incident response standpoint is, you know, they're very easy to change. And bad guys, it, burn through them very, very quickly. There's a very fast burn rate. So unless something is hard-coded into that bot, unless something is hard-coded into, you know, their attacking uh, infrastructure, uh, the, 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 the burn rate on IP addresses is very, 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 very short. And, and it's very easy to obfuscate. It's trivial to use something like Plink or SSH to be able to tunnel uh, traffic through another uh, location. It's trivial to use a VPN. I mean, this was sort of the, the, if you follow any of this on Twitter or any of the other social media outlets, when the Sony hack happened, I'm not in any way questioning their attribution. I'm just simply saying that there were certain people who questioned whether or not simply because an attack originated from a North Korean IP doesn't necessarily mean North Korea launched it. Now, they very well might have. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, that their attribution is incorrect, but the point is, it's, it's trivial, again, to be able to tunnel traffic through another IP. Uh, and so, uh, while this, is, this can be a useful statistic and can be a useful data point, um, there are significant limitations to it and, uh, uh, that need to be borne in mind. Uh, domain names are the next layer on the pyramid, and again, there are some useful aspects to this, and here we start to get into a little bit more of, you know, identifying some of the, the more difficult to change features uh, of a, an attack sequence, if you will, uh, depending upon what it is that we're talking about. It's very easy to change the domain, and there's, uh, there's algorithms that are out there that generate, you know, literally hundreds if not thousands of domains per minute. And so, you know, it's, it's dynamic, and each time it, it regenerates or each time it responds, um, we're seeing that with, like, ransomware and things of that nature, where they're using these uh, dynamically generated uh, domains, uh, and it's very, very difficult. It's, it's almost impossible to put blacklists on your firewalls fast enough to be able to um, uh, isolate that. Uh, and there's also a fast burn rate on that. And you can see, uh, here's where you would actually find the... Uh, the a lot of those artifacts, the browser history, firewall log, uh, DNS cache, uh, DNS server logs. So the logs are usually pretty easy for enterprises to be able to identify and to be able to pull back. But being able to pull back, let's say, browser history from a laptop, for instance, um, you know, if that laptop was operating outside the environment, and let's face it, how much good would it be if it couldn't? Uh, you know, can you actually pull the browser history off that laptop? And if you don't have the tools in place to be able to do that, that's something that maybe you want to explore and look at different tools to be able to pull that off of uh, the browser history because it may or may not be something that would be in your proxy log. It may or may not be something that would be in your log unless it were on your VPN when it was browsing. And some of the things to look for when you're looking through these artifacts, 
This is a very common technique that uh, threat actors will use. If you notice, um, can anybody tell me the difference between those two do domain names? Number one. Number one, correct. Yes. I, I, I apologize, I don't have the Chosky to give you for that. But, uh, but yes, there's a number one there. But at a glance, the human eye looks at that and it looks, again, totally legit. It looks like it's the, 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 the real site, and yet a single character like that that, that changes um, can, can fool people into thinking that this is legitimate. And we've seen this again and again. There were, there were threat actors in Russia that had used this technique to, to uh, uh, make it appear as though these domains that email, phishing emails were coming from, that uh, there were no links that were directing these phishing emails into what appeared to be legitimate government or military sites. And in reality, what they've done, they, they strategically changed you know, the spelling of one character or two characters, instead of an M in, in, in that one instance, they had an M, instead of an M for mill, it was RN. So if you look at it at a glance, uh, the R and the N kind of blend together and it looks like an M. And it's one of those things that just sort of, it tricks a human into doing something that they shouldn't do. Um, and there's some really good research that's that's being done on this. Open DNS, I'll give them some credit for some of the things that they're doing. Um, DEF CON 22, uh, they had a great uh, presentation there. And I know the materials are online. If you, if you Google that, uh, catching malware en masse, what they did was they were actually able to use a big data approach with the, the frequency and the, the, the time to live. There was a whole long list of artifacts that they looked at to determine whether or not uh, a domain would become malicious. Not whether or not it's known to be malicious, but this is a domain that has never been seen before, it's never been used before, you've never seen it on your firewall, and yet they could predict with frightening accuracy whether or not that, that domain would become malicious based on a whole list of uh, indicators. And then, of course, there's a number of different sources that you can use to determine whether or not domains that you're seeing, if you're seeing sketchy information in your environment, if you're seeing systems that are connecting over unusual ports or connecting to, like I mentioned, Ukraine, or uh, believe it or not, there was one customer I had a long time ago uh, where I worked for a different company, and, and we were doing a POC, and they started looking at their traffic, and they had uh, connections going to Antarctica, to, to, to the research station there, and uh, clearly had no legitimate reason for that. Um, so, um, as we move our way up the stack, we start getting into, notice that we start getting into um, uh, items that are very, very difficult to change, potentially. And, and, and you'll see that as we move up, then, you know, and this goes back to that pyramid of pain. What's the pain for the adversary to change his or her approach, or their approach, you know, to getting into your network? Um, trivial to change hashes, trivial to change IP addresses, um, trivial to change domains, but it still speaks more to their TTPs, and we'll talk about that in a minute, techniques, uh, and draw a blank, but, uh, uh, anyway, uh, it, it speaks to um, how they how they uh, operate, and um, uh, but host and, and network artifacts. Some of these artifacts can be very very difficult for bad guys to change. So mutexes are a good example. So um, mutexes are um, you know where uh, that that's a that's a, a a construct that it's in memory. It's a mutually exclusive lock. Um, and it can be used to identify whether or not malware is already running on a system. Um, and that's one of the ways that bad guys understand whether or not a system is already compromised is to look for, they, they create a mutex, and then they can look for that mutex to determine whether or not that, that uh, system is already compromised. Um, and uh, in that situation, that's something that would be very difficult for them to, to recode that attack uh, tool around it. Uh, strings in memory can give a lot of really good information about, the, you know, uh, tro Trojans and bots. Sometimes you'll see command strings and things of that nature, so you know exactly what it does. Um, and you can see, um, you know, uh, some of the ways that we would identify this or operationalize it, you know, stacking, uh, frequency analysis, uh, looking for persistence mechanisms and auto runs. Uh, those are all very effective means of, of being able to identify these and collect that information 
uh, for future use. And when we get into tools, um, that's where you know we start moving to a point where it becomes easier to identify specific attackers, specific, specific campaigns. I mentioned you know the encrypted RAR files, for instance. Um, you know, attackers are human beings, uh, but and and because of that, they're lazy. So you know, they tend to use the same things over and over again. If something is working, why would you change it? So in in this case, what we're looking at are you know distinctive beaconings, uh, you know, certain type of uh, command and control infrastructure, a certain type of tool infrastructure that they continue to reuse. Uh, very common attacks, maybe that they're using web shells. Uh, Mimi cats, do they use putty or plank you know, to, to, to tunnel traffic through? Uh, WinRAR, I mentioned, and, uh, and other tools and things of that nature. So if you start to see these same things again and again with different intrusions, it can lead you to the conclusion that this is the same organization. Even though the attack vector may be very different, even though they've used a completely different approach to getting into your network, um, it, it could, in, in fact, be the same organization. Um, and again, when you can build indicators around these different things and look for these per particular areas and these particular artifacts, uh, that becomes very, very difficult for the adversary to change, and it makes it that much easier to be able to spot that activity. So then we get into TTP, TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. So a little bit of an Elmer Fudd moment there before. But, um, so this is where it's very, very difficult to change. This is these. This is the the pinnacle of the pyramid. So the the attack patterns, the tool versions. Uh, in some cases, the window size. You know what was the uh, uh, what was the language parameter set to? And that's some of the things. Some of the attribution that was done was you guys. I'm sure have seen the white papers where the localization variables were set to a certain Asian country that's been very foremost in the news and this sort of thing. Um, maybe a data exfiltration technique, maybe a particular country of operation, uh, uh, lateral movement and scanning techniques, maybe they use the same NMAP string uh, on, on their, their lateral movement. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that, again, are very, very difficult for them to change. Uh, and, and in many cases, they're following a cookbook where they're following the same techniques over and over and over again as they enter into these networks and, and Extract extract data from them, uh, and this is where the you know this is the ultimate goal. But to be perfectly frank, very few operations have this level of operational maturity. This is where a third party commercial threat intel can come in very very handy. Um, you know, typically that's uh, that's intel that's being built based upon intrusions that they're investigating, and so um, that can be very handy to. Uh, to understand whether or not these are the same people that are active in your environment. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do you operationalize this? So um, what I mean by crossing the streams is more is better. To the extent possible, try to combine these different layers, the different artifact types. Um, you get better accuracy, better flexibility, there's multiple variations that you can identify potentially of the same family. Um, and so if you see, for instance, uh, particular hash values uh, associated with particular domain names, associated with particular tool <coughs> sets, associated with particular exfiltration techniques, you know, you can then build different indicators of compromise or use those artifacts with the tools that you have in your environment to identify when this is happening. And even if different segments of that change or modify, which they will, you still have a much higher accuracy rate in terms of identifying where potentially you know, new intrusions have come from. So one of the ways I mentioned with uh, indicators of compromise, um, if you're not ingesting IOCs, that may be something that you want to consider. There's a number of different sources for that. And again, um, operationally, most enterprises should be trying to aspire to get to a place where they can operationalize indicators of compromise directly out of their environment. There's a number of different feeds and, and formats for this. You know, most notably OpenIOC or uh, Styx, Taxi, uh, and uh, Yara. Yara is great, but it's, it's, it tends to be much more file or process oriented. You know, it's much more limited in terms of what it can identify. 
Um, OpenIOC, you can actually um, define multiple chains, like every single layer that we talked about on that pyramid, you can define with an OpenIOC IOC. The question is then, how do you operationalize that? There's a number of different tools out there that will allow you to do this on a single you know, system basis. There's a number of free tools that you can use that you, you can perform this on a single system basis. If you want to fan this out to the enterprise, that's where you start getting into the commercial tools. And again, this is a little bit outside of the realm of this particular conversation, and I don't want to turn this into a sales talk, but if you want to talk about ways that customers that we work with, you know, operationalize IOCs, that's certainly something that we can talk about in the hallway. Um, and then deep dive analysis. And again, now we're looking at, you know, really forensically analyzing you know, systems uh, that had, have known to be compromised, systems that have been involved in different campaigns, and there's a whole list of different artifacts that are available that you can glean some really awesome uh, information from. You know, the, the running processes, the network connections, um, different handles, that, that uh, file handles, mutexes, uh, memory sections. I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Scheduled tasks, uh, persistence mechanisms. And these are all fantastic areas where if you gather this information from intrusions and things that you're investigating in your environment, you know, it, it fills that tool set with the capability to then uh, understand when you see this being used again. Uh, and, and, and then once you reach that point where you're operationalizing this information, it then becomes much, much easier to spot these, even when, uh, again, there's no light blinking. Uh, and understand that bad guy's going to do everything possible not to trip the alarm. And probably one of the most uh, effective methods that, that most incident responders, you know, that I've worked with that, that you know, that given me feedback on this whole process, uh, the, the hunting and uh, data stacking and analytics, where you're looking for, you're looking across all of your hosts, and this is where you really need to start to get into, unless you're somebody who really is just an absolute god with open source and can, can create these things for yourself, um, and if you can, there's, I would recommend that you go out to the Y Combinator and get some VC funding because you could probably become a multi-gozillionaire. But um, there's a lot of good commercial tools out there uh, that will allow you to do this very, very easily and very rapidly. And that's where you start really getting the bang for the buck. And you start looking for those outliers, um, looking for those persistence mechanisms that out of 20,000 systems, we're only seeing on five, for instance. You know, why are those only on those five? Now, maybe it's legitimate. Maybe they've got a particular program that that group of people need to run, and that's their, their reboot mechanism, and it's completely legit. But again, that goes back to that cyclical cycle that we talked about, where understanding the baseline, understanding is this normal in my environment. And the only way to do that is to have that capability to be able to reach out across the entire enterprise and perform this type of frequency analysis. And, you know, again, finding out anomalies. Uh, a very common technique is it's a legitimate service name, like servicehost.exe, but it's running from the wrong directory. It should never be running from hope, from the help directory, right, or from temp. Uh, and so if you just look at a task list of what's executing on that system, it appears to be a legitimate process, and in reality, you know, it's a bot or it's some type of the Trojan. Um, spelling is another one. Uh, but the key challenge with this, quite honestly, for most organizations, is that speed of data acquisition, the scalability, the ease of search, being able to collate all that information. Think about being able to look across 100,000 systems and compare all the auto runs. I mean, that's a very daunting task. And so, uh, again, if your organization is not in a position to be able to do that today, then that's something that I would encourage that you start to think about, how would I do that? What are ways that I can do that? And if, if my processes and tools are deficient, then, you know, what are my options in terms of being able to uh, perform that? And with that, if there are any questions, uh, any, any, any questions or any items that we can delve into?